us today. My name is Ken Levinson, the executive director of WIDA. We're really uh, delighted to have so many of you here on such a lovely morning. I guess I should say Baby Shark uh, for all of you NAS fans out there. I'm not going to sing this song, although um, my kids certainly love that song. I think we'll be singing a lot of them uh, in the rain tomorrow as Baby Shark's going around. Uh, good luck, NAS, today. Hopefully, uh, not, not, a, not too many weary eyes here in the room who stayed up too late last night. Um, really uh, thrilled to have this expert panel here today. Thank you all so much for joining us today. A uh, really interesting topic, one that we've addressed before. Uh, Chris Padilla uh, has joined us on this, on this topic in the past, and we're really pleased to have you back again, Chris. And thanks to our new speakers, some of whom we haven't had before here, and we are on the stage, so really glad to have uh, some new, new voices and uh, really a topic that's getting a ton of attention these days. Even today, there was news of another big merger uh, that involved foreign investments, so these are topics that just are going to continually come up in the years to come. So we're really glad to have you all here. Just a brief commercial about some upcoming WIDA events. Friday, we do, uh, for the past few years, we've had what we call an FDA boot camp that we do with Registrar Corp. to learn all about new food and drug administration uh, import. Uh, rules for food, drugs, uh, and all the products that are regulated by the FDA. Next week, we have a really interesting event to look at the uh, digital tax issues that are prom being promulgated around the world. OECD has a new proposal on this that they have been circulating. Uh, the WTO moratorium on customs duties on digital transfers is also due to expire at the end of the year. These things are all coming together. We're going to have a discussion of that. That's next week on Wednesday. Uh, on the back of your flyer that you have in your hands has information on these events not on here and hopefully we'll announce in the next 24 hours or so is an event to look at the crisis at the WTO related to the dispute settlement, uh, the dispute settlement body uh, that uh, they're going to be not be able to hear cases after December so we'll be having an event on that in mid-November uh, we're looking at either the 14th or the 21st waiting to hear back from a couple potential speakers on that. And then lastly uh, for that's already on the calendar is our Washington International Trade Conference. We had uh, the first one last year, it was a huge success, and we're going to be doing it again this year. Uh, new speakers, different topics, uh, but trying to capture the moment on trade and look ahead to the future. That's on February 4th. It's an all day conference here at the Russian Building, and we hope you can all join us for that. And if your organization is interested in sponsoring, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact me or Dave Monyes. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Denise Jones from the Business Roundtable. Thank you so much for doing this today. Really grateful to have you here. Great from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Captain Ken. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. A special thanks to the Washington International Trade Association for hosting. Uh, we're going to talk about a set of issues that is dominating uh, trade policy discussions here in Washington, but also across the Pacific and the Atlantic. And uh, specifically, those are three issues, right? So the CFIUS and the investment review reforms. We're going to talk about export controls on emerging and foundational technologies. And the uh, ICT supply chain executive order. Now, these three US policy actions should be looked at together because they are parts of a broader strategy aimed at achieving sort of a common goal which is to address the issue of tech transfer or technology leakage from US companies to China. But implementation of these policies is particularly challenging, I would say, because of the uniqueness of the US-China relationship. Our economies are interdependent. Uh, they're entangled. Each country is the other's primary national security rival. Just look at uh, space and maritime conflict, or cyber warfare, for example, or the conflict in the South China Sea. And each is the other's key competitor in the race uh, for technology and innovation leadership. For example, in the areas of 5G and AI and quantum and many others. So the key challenge for the administration and Congress is how do you protect national security interests and also ensure that the U.S. maintains competitiveness that we maintain our technology leadership in emerging and foundational technologies. We're going to be doing a deep dive into these issues on, on this panel, so let me uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, David Fagan, he's partner and co-chair of uh, cross-border investment and national security matters at Covington and Berlin. John Miller, uh, senior vice president of policy and senior counsel for trust, data, and technology at ITI. 
Chris Padilla, Vice President of uh, Government and Regulatory Affairs at IBM, and Jonathan Samford, Senior Vice President for External Affairs at the Organization for International Investment. Uh, their bios are available to you in the uh, behind the agenda. It would take me uh, the entire event to, read them, <laughs> to give you a, their bios, so I'll let you take a look at that for yourself. But I'd like to ask each of our panelists to give you know, about seven minutes of remarks on sort of the three uh, key issues that we're here to talk about. And then we'll spend some time uh, sort of having a moderated Q&A discussion, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So let me begin with you, David. Um, could you take us back um, a few years and talk about how, how all this came together? You know, ECRA, FIRMA, give us some of the legislative history, uh, legislative intent, and, and sort of an overview of the, the key sort of laws and policies around this area. Is there a magic switch? It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on? Oh, great. There is a magic switch. Um, thanks, Denise. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm happy to bat lead off. I promise I will stay on the right side of the first baseline. Um, don't call me out. Uh, Denise, thanks for that. And, and I will say, in the intro, you managed to identify the elephant in the room and actually name the issue, China, 10 times more than Congress did in any of the two pieces of legislation I talked about, or that the supply chain ICT ordered it. Um, but I, I do want to go back. You asked me to go back a little bit, and um, I'm going to go back about 10 years or so, and then maybe go back a little bit further. Um, so around 2005, um, I was sitting where many of you guys were sitting on in a program somewhat like this um, that was intended to address national security issues and the private sector, or at least national security issues and the law. Um, and I did something that I hope none of you guys will find yourself doing. I was bored out of my mind because nobody was talking about anything that was relevant to the stuff that I was working on. It was all public and international law, military law, and this was 2005. There was actual law and regulation that addressed national security issues in the private sector, and so I wrote down a few things and ended up going to Georgetown and teaching a class on national security law in the private sector. Um, one of the principles of that class, one, one of the things it sought to address is why is national security relevant to the private sector, particularly in the U.S.? Um, and there's a very simple answer to that. The U.S. doesn't have national assets, notwithstanding what some commentary may be about certain companies or um, how companies actually may themselves. The reality is that the U.S. is entirely dependent on its infrastructure and the like for the private sector. Um, so we don't actually have, you know, even our national laboratories are federally funded but privately operated. We do not own, the U.S. government does not own the telecommunications infrastructure. Even unlike some European countries, which formerly owned it and then privatized it, they kept a strategic economic interest. We simply don't have that. Um, and so the model in the U.S. actually dating back um, to World War I is that there needs to be a legal and regulatory system that enables the benefits of private ownership but at appropriate places intersects federal law and regulation to protect national security. Um, and that actually started after or in the context of World War I where the federal government decided to expropriate certain chemical companies that were German owned. That's the reason why there are two Mercs in the world today. Um, and it extended after that. There was the original um, radio and communications regulations were somewhat geared to threats that were perceived at the time from the UK Navy, believe it or not. And then there's been spurts and proliferations of laws and regulations since then, post 9-11, um, where the government actually got more involved in communications and the like with the private sector. Um, and now, over the last year, because of the perceived risks of China, and that has resulted to date in three legal developments that do interject the government more into the regulation of investment 
commerce. Those include the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, FIRMA, which was enacted in August 2018, which has reformed the CFIUS process. It includes the Export Control Reform Act, which I know Chris will talk about further, on the outbound export control side, and includes the supply chain, uh, the ICT supply chain executive order. So that's a little bit in terms of the history of why, why do we have these regulations. Now, Denise touched on what's driving the current situation. And that's, it's very simple. It's the, it's the great power competition between the US and China. Um, both the US and China, for their own reasons, this is not simply a US issue. I think both countries, it is fair to say, have examined their dependencies on each other and for their own reasons have reached some conclusions that they need to be less reliant on supply, investment, and trade. It is not just the US regulating inbound from China. It's not just China directing it at US or other investors coming in. They both reached that conclusion. In the US, this is in, has manifested itself, as I said, in the enhanced regulation on investment trade and technology transfers. To give you one and perhaps the easiest data point to digest for why this is coming up now, in, in the CFIUS world that, that I deal in, from 2005 to 2007, so just over a decade ago, do you know how many Chinese investments were reviewed by CFIUS? Four. Four over that three year period. There was one very prominent attempted deal that was not reviewed, that was Siemens attempted acquisition of Unical. So then there were five big Chinese deals over a three year period. The data for CFIUS reviews of Chinese investment for 2016 and 2017, leaving aside 2018, 2016 and 2017, there, it's not out yet, hopefully it will be soon. So I can only guess and speculate, so don't quote me on this as these are the figures that actually were the number of Chinese transactions that were reviewed. But um, our best estimate is there are probably, in those two years, at least 150 Chinese deals. So in a decade, you went from really what was a trickle of investment and M&A activity from China intersecting with the US to a flood. Some might argue, and I think there's some fairness to this, that, that, that that's only a good thing. Inbound capital flows to the United States enhance our economy. That's also good for security. Greater connectivity between the US and China, the two largest economies in the world, is good for our national security. And so, as China grew, it was a bad thing to have that investment. I think there, you can accept that as being valid, but also recognize that within the US national security community, there was another perspective. And that is, as the US and China conducted more commercial activity, as there was more investment, um, as there were greater Chinese interests and a greater diversity of industries and businesses, there also grew a potential national security risk. Because while the US has regulated national security and commerce for over 100 years, in fact, there is no historical precedent for the most important economic partner of the United States also being its most significant current and long-term geostrategic, political, and military rival. And that was the view of the national security community, both in the executive branch and in Congress. That presented hard policy issues to grapple with. What do you do about a potential, I'm not saying it is, but from a certain perspective, there is a view, what do you do about a potential long-term existential threat to US national security where there's also a need and desire to maintain that level of economic activity, and from a national security perspective, we're highly dependent on the private sector that's interacting and transacting with China. Um, so what, what you have seen is these laws and regulations in these three areas. I would say, and I'm gonna to touch on them each briefly, I would say that is not going to be 
the end of the story. What has happened over the last 18 months to two years as we started to regulate investment more and trade more and supply chain more is the U.S. is taking a holistic view on law regulation and industrial policy and how it is positioned in the great power competition with China over the duration of the 21st century. And so they're likely to continue to be more laws and regulations and the like. Um, and, and one final point on that before I turn to the specifics on the laws, it, it would be a mistake, and I think most people in the room recognize this, but I think more broadly in the public, this is perceived to degree as well as it's the Trump administration doing this. It would be a mistake to perceive it that way. Many of these concerns and the laws and regulations, in fact, had their origins, the initial work, began in 2016 or before, before the election, before Trump took office. And there is complete bipartisan consensus on the analysis of the risk. There's not necessarily consensus, I would say, on the prescriptions for what you do about that risk. But there's total consensus, and it's not just at a political level, I would say it's also at the national security professional level, on the risk. That means that whatever happens in the next election, you're likely to continue to see law and regulation in this area. So let me just drill down a little bit on these three, and then I'll, I'll stop and obviously we'll engage more in the Q&A. So first, FIRMA, the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act. As I mentioned, it was enacted in August as part of 2018 as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. It is the most significant reform of CFIUS uh, in 30 years. Um, it, the concerns that were informing that um, centered on a couple of things. One, concerns that CFIUS was not seeing, that the U.S. national security community was not seeing and having an opportunity to review Chinese investment that was not controlling of the U.S. business, but nevertheless strategic. So certain non-controlling, but not non-passive transactions. Um, there were also concerns about outbound technology transfer, which ultimately led to the export control reform act. And then, broader business relationships that were not subject to CFIUS authority at all. FIRMA took that policy concern and essentially broadened the aperture of CFIUS to review transactions, so enhanced CFIUS <coughs> authorities and extended its jurisdiction through two primary mechanisms. The first is it actually expanding jurisdiction to review certain non-controlling but non-passive transactions involving critical technology, sensitive personal data, and critical infrastructure. It also expanded to include certain real estate transactions that were greenfield transactions that where the authorities didn't exist before. And then it coupled that with, for the first time, mandated certain filings with CFIUS. So historically, CFIUS is entirely a voluntary process. Everybody asked why we would ever go through that if it was voluntary. The answer to that is the whole framework is set up to in, in, uh, incent filings where there could be a national security interest. There's no statute of limitations. If you don't file if this has authority, and they have the ultimate authority at any time after the fact to, if they want to, to compel a filing and then ultimately force a divestiture on terms they and the government dictate. So it doesn't send voluntary filings, but it never mandated them. Firma said that's not enough. We need, CFIUS needs to be able to see other transactions um, on a mandatory basis. So it expanded jurisdiction and coupled it with certain mandated filings. That broadened the horizon of CFIUS. Rulemaking is ongoing. There are a lot of new authorities for CFIUS. Um, as you may know, the proposed rules to implement the vast majority of those new authorities, such as the critical technologies were addressed in a pilot program last year, everything else. Um, there was rules that were proposed on September 17th. The comment period ended on October 17th. And those final rules must be in place by February 2020. Um, there was another issue that arose during the legislative debate, and that is, the concerns over outbound technology transfers that China, through industrial policy law and regulation, was enticing the transfer of technology to enable indigenous development in ways that would advance Chinese competitiveness and their national security interests to the detriment of US national security. Um, thanks to Professor Padilla, Sidious <laughs> was saved from having to potentially deal with that, but the right authorities, the export control authorities, were given enhanced 
authority to deal with emerging and foundational technologies. I know Chris will address that. Uh, and then one of the issues that CFIUS has dealt with for years is what are the risks of foreign adversaries getting into supply chain? This has come up in telecommunications transactions and in other transactions involving IT systems and the like for, for years, for decades with CFIUS. That concern, that work that was identified through the CFIUS process and through the team telecom process led to an interagency discussion about, well, what more can we do to address supply chain? That ultimately resulted in this, the ICT supply chain executive order that President Trump issued in May and for which we are still awaiting rules implementing. I know John will address that. So I'm, I'm going to stop there um, and allow our, the others to pick up the other issues, but happy to discuss and answer questions. Thank you, David. Um, John, I'd like to turn to you next to talk about this last item that David mentioned, so the ICT supply chain executive order. And related to that, but of course separate, is the addition of the Chinese companies to the BIS entity list. Um, you know, ITI obviously represents many of the largest players in the technology industry. What are some, what's the, what's your perspective on, on uh, what we should expect in the forthcoming rule to implement the executive order? And, you know, what is the impact potentially on industry? Uh, thanks, Denise, and uh, thanks to uh, Ken and, and Wicca uh, for the, the invitation for, and for everyone uh, for being here. Um, you know, I think it probably makes sense to, to take a little bit of a step back and describe what's actually in the executive order and why, in some ways, even though everyone's waiting for the rules, um, I don't want to say they don't matter, but the, the perspective of at least most in the interagency that, that, that I've spoken to is that executive order as written is, in, is and was enforceable immediately anyway. Um, but, but, but just to, to add a little bit of context to this discussion of the executive order. Um, so the executive order on securing the ICT and services supply chain, as Ken mentioned, uh, was issued back, back on, in, in May, on May 15th. Um, you know, it, I think it's important to note the authorities under which the executive order was uh, written at the CAIPA, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, so the president did indeed declare a national emergency with respect to this issue, so if that doesn't underscore uh, the potential uh, national security implications of, you know, from the perspective of the administration, I, you know, I, I don't know what does, and, and it is clear that, that from a commercial standpoint, we do need to take the, the national security implications of, of these issues uh, seriously. Um, that said, there also, I think one of the striking things about the executive order when it came out and it, 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 it had been uh, su suggested that, that it was coming out for, for quite a while, um, but, but once it really did come out, it was actually, uh, I think, broader than, than most expected um, and, uh, and had really broader implications from a commercial standpoint. Uh, you know, and it's broad at least in, in three ways. I mean, number one, the uh, scope of potentially impacted ICT products and services. I, I guess the easiest way to say it is that it potentially impacts all ICT products and services, uh, you know, full stop, not just telecommunications networks, etc. cetera. Um, it's also very broad in, in terms of the potential transactions that, that are impacted. Um, and again, it's a pretty wide scope of, uh, of, of activity. Uh, you know, it, it, it names, um, executive order names, acquisition, importation, transfer, installation, dealing in, or use of, of ICT uh, products and services uh, writ large. Uh, and then also even the, 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 the scope of risks that, that, that are addressed um, and the uh, potential uh, foreign adversaries, which I'll get to in a minute, are, are also really broad. So, uh, you know, in terms of what does the executive order do, um, uh, it, it, it sets forth those, those various transactions that uh, are pro can be prohibited once the Secretary of Commerce, Commerce has determined that such transactions, number one, involve foreign adversaries. I think importantly here, um, as was previously mentioned, the executive order does not mention China, but it, 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 it kind of tees up that, you know, quote unquote, countries or companies can be named uh, 
as foreign adversaries pursuant to the executive order, uh, and, and that also includes persons controlled by, subject to the jurisdiction, etc. So that's a pretty wide um, scope of potential companies that, that are uh, impacted. Or And again, if, if, if punch, entire countries are named pursuant to the executive order, obviously that's going to have very broad implications. Um, and then the executive order uh, provides that uh, you know, if, if ICT uh, products or services in the U.S. pose an undue risk of, uh, or if those transactions pose an undue risk of sabotage or subversion of those ICT products and services, um, uh, and that again is defined as to the design, integrity, manufacturing, production, distribution, installation, operation, or maintenance of those ICT products and services, or potentially uh, impact uh, the and, and, and cause sabotage or catastrophic effects on the security of critical infrastructure or, or otherwise pose uh, a risk to U.S. national security. Uh, if, if those thresholds are, are met, then the, uh, the Secretary of Commerce is indeed authorized to take any such actions, including directing the timing and the manner of the cessation of those transactions as prohibited pursuant to the section one of the order, and then it, importantly, it's directed to adopt appropriate rules and regulations as may be necessary to implement the order. So, uh, you know, I think every, there, there's been understandably a high degree of anxiety regarding what these rules may look like when they come out. They were due October 12th. I would venture to guess that maybe this, this event was timed so that the rules would already be out, but, but they indeed are, are not out, um, but it, it is the position of, the, again, the stakeholders that, that we've spoken to that through the executive order, that the, 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 the powers granted to the secretary are actually enforceable immediately, um, but obviously they haven't really been in, in, enforced yet. So I think that's uh, certainly significant. And something else that was contemplated by the executive order is a potential licensing regime to uh, permit authorized transactions um, and as, as we understand it, the, the rules, when they do come out, are likely not to address such a potential licensing regime. A couple of other things that the, that the um, executive order required that have actually um, happened is uh, it also required two other reports to help inform the Commerce Department's rules. Number one, uh, a report by, by ODNI, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, regarding really focused on the foreign adversaries um, aspect of this. Um, no doubt using their intelligence information. Uh, not surprisingly, I don't know many who have much visibility into that report. Um, but then there was also a report required by the Department of Homeland Security to essentially conduct an assessment of the criticality of ICT products and services. Um, uh, Department of Homeland Security, I think to their credit, did uh, in, in fact, and what they were in fact directed under the executive order to consult with the uh, private sector, uh, specifically the sector coordinating councils uh, to in conducting that criticality assessment it was, it was certainly a, a um, compressed time frame, I, I think, but uh, the, what, what DHS tried to do is essentially break down the, the, the ICT ecosystem and create a, a, a taxonomy of, of sorts, um, uh, you know, breaking it down ultimately into 61 ICT elements, um, uh, and then focusing specifically on the so-called connect function of national critical functions, which really does uh, deal with the communications network. So, so what um, DHS did in their initial assessment is to some extent downscope the potentially broad scope of this uh, of the executive order. 